Welcome to episode 86 of the Lone Hockey Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about some standouts from yesterday's game between Chicago and Minnesota. And it was a 7-2 win for the Wild, and they had a really good game. And they had a lot of their scoring come through the second period. And the first, I believe, was tied after one, and then the second period they just kept scoring. And there was a late goal by Connor Bedard in the latter half and the latter portion of the second period, but it wasn't enough, obviously. And at the same time, there are a lot of really good standout sequences. And in terms of standouts on Minnesota's side first, one of the biggest ones by far, and he had a really good year last year, was Brock Faber. And in terms of his puck movement, his agility, how he was moving, how he's using his feet, defending, and how he's able to shut down plays and the effectiveness and how he's able to attack, he looks like a defenseman that could put up even better numbers than he had last year. And he put up really good foundational numbers last season. So he looks like a player that is only going to continue to get stronger and continue to get better over time. And two assists and a shot, really good game, really good effort from him all around in terms of his ability. And then another one is actually two, because I wanted to touch on a sequence that they had was their power play sequence with Matt Zuccarello and Kirill Kaprizov and one of their power plays on the second period. And what stood out in terms of that was Zuccarello is able to use a little bit of deception in his playmaking and how he's able to move the puck. So he used the deception, and then he was able to sell the pass, make a no-look pass, and be able to find Kaprizov on the weak side of the ice who faded entirely away from the play. He used a one-timer, he had wide open that to shoot at, and he scored. And it was a really terrific sequence. Kaprizov had four points in the game, one goal and three assists. And that was his lone goal. And it really stood out because it showed the playmaking skill of Zuccarello, who Zuccarello is not necessarily a super high-end play driver, but he's a really good complementary player to Kaprizov. And surely some of his production comes from Kirill because they have really good chemistry together. They thrive together. And they've been on the line for quite some time now, both on the power play at five on five. So he was a really big standout. Another one was Jacob Lauko or Jakob Lauko, and really showed good tenacity on the puck. He had an awkward hit in the middle portion of the game, but he showed really good compete, really good tenacity. He's been around a different, few different teams now, but at the same time, he's been really good, and he was really good yesterday on the offensive side of the puck at being able to generate shots, generate volume, also generate quality. He had a goal. He had an assist, and he had four shots. So he was really standing out in terms of his offensive ability and also his defensive ability, his ability to check, ability to track back through the neutral zone, and ability to be engaged defensively in many different situations. And then a couple more, Joel Erickson Act was really good. He scored one in this game. And then Jared Spurgeon was another two goals. And Jared Spurgeon looked really good. He looks healthy. He looks strong. He looks competitive, and he looks like him his natural self and one of the better defensemen in the league in terms of pure analytics and in terms of the eye test, you don't necessarily notice him, but you notice the subtlety in his subtleties in his game. But when you really dive deeper in his game based on the data and what he's able to accomplish there, not only defensively, but offensively as well at even strength, he's a very productive player. It's going to be interesting to see how he plays this season, how productive he can be and how productive he can be heading into the future for the Wild as well. And a big part of their top four, a big part of their minute-eating defensemen on the power play, PK, and many different situations. So Spurgeon's a very important component to the overall makeup of the Wild, obviously their captain at the same time. So he was really good, but he showed some really good offensive skill, more noticeably than his defensive skill, which is quite ironic when talking about him. But he showed really good ability. And then for the Hawks, we'll talk about some. And Connor Bedard, none other than him, was really good. And he looks really calm. I remember last preseason, preseason when he had the puck on his sick, he looked a little jittery at times. This preseason, and obviously he's already had a season under his belt, so it's much different. But he looks much calmer with the puck, and he looks like he's transporting it with not only pace, but with a lot more poise. And he's able to make – very decisive decisions at the same time. He had a goal, like I said, with that play in it was three tenths of a second left in the period. So he was able to score then. And it was a nice little tough goal where 
he was able to poke the puck home. And he's really good. He showed really good skill, obviously, offensively in terms of his ability to draw guys to him. He's really good, and he's become better at putting guys on his hip. So by being able to protect the puck and being able to use a wider stance in his base, he's able to get more radius of space and cover more radius of space in his puck handling. And so it allows him to extend possessions a little bit cleaner. So I've noticed that a little bit more throughout the preseason, but nothing too crazy from him. I would imagine it would be somewhat somewhat similar of a season. I don't necessarily see him becoming a 80, 90 point player right away. I feel like that will take a couple of years, but surely I can see him being a point per game guy again this year. He's right on track, right on cue to get back to that form very quickly. And based on what he's done in preseason, I'm not surprised at all that he could get at least to that rate minimum. I don't think there's going to be any sort of slump because obviously the label is the sophomore slump, but I don't see that happening with him. I see him only continuing to get better. And another standout was Tyler Bertuzzi, even though he had a couple penalties, especially in the latter half of the game. I think he stood out offensively and generating chances. And again, a good complementary player for Bedard in terms of their style, somewhat opposites. So Bertuzzi is more of a competitive, tenacious type of player, a forechecking type of player. He likes to play more of a checking role, but has some raw skill and raw flair. Bedard, obviously the prominent scorer, the prominent playmaker, who can do a little bit of everything offensively. So Bertuzzi gets some pucks really well. So that's the good thing about having opposites on lines is it's actually a positive thing. It's, I don't necessarily see that being a negative thing. I think it's actually a worse thing when you have similar type of players on the same line because you're getting carbon copies of one another versus if you have counteracting styles, you get a little bit more balance in that sense. Not necessarily balance in terms of scoring, more balance in the side of the overall structure of the game. So this fits within the paradigms of a team structure and how they're able to adjust tactically within the game. So with Bertuzzi, he's one of those players who, again, he's not the most skilled. He's not the most efficient scorer. He can score and he can make plays, but he's not going to showcase it a ton and very consistently and in, in an elite manner. But he can still do it. So that's really important. And obviously the prominence and standout ability to his game is his checking team. So that's what's going to allow him to be able to forecheck, to retrieve pucks, and then find Bedard in really good spots, ideally in the ozone, in the slot area, in the high danger areas. So he was really good. Another one that was noticeable but not standout worthy per se was Louis Crevier, seventh round pick by them a few years ago, a handful of years ago, and really continued to get better throughout junior and then pro playing in Rockford. And what stands out with Crevier's game is obviously his size, first and foremost. But in terms of how he utilizes his size, and how he's able to use his frame, that's actually a really important detail to his game. Because some, especially taller defensemen, it takes a longer time for them to actually adjust because they're still trying to figure out coordination as they age. They're still tr trying to figure out how to use their longer limbs because they have longer limbs than smaller players in their joints. And they're still trying to figure out how to actually incorporate their size into their game because you're an outlier when you're standing at 6'8". Not many players have that size. Not many players actually reach that size. So he's one of few. And he stands out. He's not a purely physical player defensively, but he stands out in terms of his shutdown qualities and obviously his longer reach, his stick, and his gap control. He can maintain gaps from a longer distance than most players because of his size, so that's an advantage for him. But it's more in terms of how he closes the gap, so how he uses his feet, how he adjusts his feet. Sometimes he can get positional miscues because of his feet. He doesn't match the speed of the opposing player fast enough on occasions, especially on line rush and transition defense scenarios and trying to deny entries. But he stands out because he can cover a large radius of space with his feet and his stick. So he was good, very steady, but not, again, not super flashy. And then one more we'll get to. He played on the power play as well outside of Taylor Hall. We've talked about Taylor Hall. I've liked him throughout the preseason thus far. I really believe if he stays healthy, he can be in for 
around a 50 point season. I don't see him being a 60, 70 point guy anymore, really. It's it's tough to imagine that, especially since he's really and mostly reliant on his playmaking. It's really hard to imagine him eclipsing 60, 70 points at this point in his career. It would be great if he was able to, but I don't necessarily envision that. I do like his playmaking because he can be a little bit one-dimensional at times because he's not much of a shooter. Sometimes you notice his checking details, but not a ton. You don't notice his defensive play at all. But I notice his playmaking skill. That's the thing that stands out the most when it comes to Hall. And how he's able to make plays, how he's able to make seam plays is really unique and really rare. That vision that he has is really rare and testament to why he's a first overall pick decades or not decades ago, a little over a decade ago, almost two. And he's really stand out and he really does stand out in terms of his ability to lure guys to him and how he's able to make plays in that sense. And then last but not least, Philip Kershev. And I've liked Kershev last year. I liked his game and he eclipsed 50 points which was a breakout season for him. And he was really good in the power play, really good at even strength, really good in terms of playmaking details, similar to Hall in a sense. And he was really calm in terms of his playmaking, how he's able to make decisions with pace and how he's able to execute on his decisions. So he was able to find passes in small areas really well inside the ozone and deep inside the ozone. And Kurdishev was very standout with in terms of his offense and the play overall in that side of his game as well.